thumbs up if you can see that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks again, everybody. Um, uh, yeah, as, as Brahman said, I, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the past, present, and future of climate change. Um, and, I, and I should say at the beginning that I'm, I'm not a climate scientist, actually. I, I actually am an ecologist. I study how climate uh, impacts natural systems. I'm very interested in our ability to um, forecast and predict how uh, climate change might impact natural systems. And of course, through that work, I, I've learned a lot about climate change, um, but there's, there's always more to learn for sure. Um, so I, I guess the other thing I wanted to say as an introduction is I, the first time I gave this talk was in 2019, right before COVID hit. Um, and I haven't updated my slides very much since then. So you're going to see some dates from 2019 and those sorts of things. And I guess the bad news is, is that things have only gotten worse uh, since I first gave this talk, you know, four short years ago. Um, all right, so now I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Sorry, folks, but I am having some, it's always the way it goes with Zoom, right? I hid the, I hid the controls, they came back up and they're in my way. I know, we, we practiced yeah. before. I know, yeah, that, you know, it likes to trick you. Um, okay, so, you know, of course, climate change um, has been in the news for a long time and, and it's, it's um, really moved beyond, um, you know, for a long time, I think what was mainly in the news about climate change was, was the debate about climate change and the science of climate change. But now we see it affecting uh, all sorts of things, right? It's, it's the economy. Um, it is heat waves in places like India and Australia, and of course the US and Europe all over the place. Um, there's, uh, you know, estimates of, of what climate change will feel like. And that's, that's something I will get to in my app. This is actually a, a headline from Breitbart News, which I was very proud to be featured on at the time. Um, it's interesting. Um, and of course, the, the impacts of extreme events, right? Flooding, fires, um, you know, this, this at, in 2019, it felt to me like this is when things were really ramping up. Of course, you know, climate change had been happening and things, but it seems like over the last five years, especially, it seems like globally things are just fraying apart, right? There's the mega fires, there's all these different things happening. Um, there's the, the, how climate change can fuel wars, um, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's really all aspects of life at this point. Um, but I want to take a step back. Oh, there's one more. There's actually more than one. There's several. <laughs> um, and, and, and go to the past. So the, the poll was was a very appropriate place to start because that's where I'm going to start too. But I'm going to go back further in time. Um, but before we do, let's let's all go to, to Antarctica, which as we all know, right, it's the southern, the continent on the southern poles, uh, extremely cold. It's had uh, an ice cap on it for millions of years. And it's responding to, to climate change very rapidly, like uh, just like the Arctic is as well. But Antarctica was not always a freezing cold place. If you go back even further in time, you know, 10 million, tens of millions of years ago, um, there were tropical forests or temperate forests in Antarctica. There are fossils of the dinosaurs and uh, plants that lived in Antarctica. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is good evidence that climate change isn't a new thing, right? We hear all the time climate always changes um, and it can change quite dramatically, especially over long periods of time. The question is, well, why, right? Why, how can Antarctica be under ice today and millions of years ago be, you know, similar to what we might call a jungle uh, or a tropical forest uh, tens of millions of years ago? Well, it turns out that some of the answers lie in the ice itself. Um, so as you may know, scientists often go out to large ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica and in the mountains and other places like that, and they can take ice cores. And in Antarctica, these ice cores can be quite deep because the ice is so deep and it's so old. And we can learn a lot from what is recorded in those ice cores. And it turns out from Antarctica, we can get a record of, of changes, not just in temperature, but the composition of the atmosphere going back hundreds of thousands of years. So we're gonna be looking at a few figures like this. So for this first one, I would just wanna explain kind of the individual pieces. So it'll help, help you follow along. So on the bottom axis here is time, and we're talking thousands of years ago. So on the far left 
is 400,000 years ago, and on the right is, is moving towards present. And then on the y-axis here, we have a temperature anomaly. And so what's a temperature anomaly? Well, the way that these data are often shown is how different uh, the temperature was at a time in the past versus some other reference period. And so in this case, we're gonna use about the last thousand years or so as our reference period. And so that's the zero line here. And so anything above that line means it was warmer than the last thousand years on average. And anything below that line is colder than the last thousand years or so on average. And so if we plot, and drum roll, let's hope this works, if we plot the temperature data that are able to be um, sort of read, if you will, from this ice core, we can see how temperature globally, right? This is a global signal of temperature uh, changed over the last several hundred thousand years. And one thing you might immediately notice is that there's kind of the cyclical pattern of, of warming, that there's these spikes and in, in warming, and then there's these long periods of cooling, and these are, are the ice ages, right? So overall, the planet generally was a lot colder than it is today with some brief uh, warming periods. And um, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, right, at the height of these ice ages, places like North America were covered in ice caps. Um, in some cases, they were kilometers thick. They uh, spread across the continent and receded and spread across the continent in waves multiple times. Um, you can kind of think of this as kind of a sort of a, a slow migration. Um, that occurred with the ice of it melting and, and, and regrowing. And so that means if you were to, to leave Maryland and drive north up through Pennsylvania or through Ohio, you would eventually have encountered a wall of ice that could be hundreds or, or thousands of, of meters tall, depending on the location. So a completely different world. Um, and so, you know, this is again, very relevant to the quiz. So 15,000 years ago, Western Maryland, so this is focusing on Western Maryland, was colder than Northern Alaska is today. So that, that line right there that I've just highlighted is the, uh, in terms of the temperature anomaly, where Fairbanks would fall relative to Maryland's climate today. So we're talking on average, it's closer to the 23 number, um, but this again, this is focused just on, on Western Maryland, not all of the mid-Atlantic. Um, and so, you know, that the fact that, that Western Maryland was this cold means, you know, biologically, it was a very different place. And we can, of course, learn a lot um, about the animals that lived in those places in these places uh, during the last ice age. But um, we can also learn some things about the vegetation. So not that far from from where I am right now, there is a place called Big Pond in Buchanan State Forest just over the Maryland-Pennsylvania border north of Flintstone, Maryland. And if you hike the trail to Big Pond, you would eventually encounter what looks kind of like a glorified puddle in the forest. Um, not, not a very large uh, body of water by any sense, not very deep, but Big Pond has been here for 10,000 years, 15,000 years or more. And I think maybe Dave Nelson gave a talk many years ago on, on fossil pollen. So this, this could be a review for some of you if you attended that talk. But um, of course, every spring, um, the trees and the vegetation are, are producing pollen. Um, it often causes us problems because of allergies. And all that pollen in the air settles on the, the surface of ponds and lakes and eventually works its way into the sediments. And it does that every year over thousands of years and we get a record of what the vegetation was through time. And, you know, if you go back to the Ice Age, Western Maryland and Mid-Atlantic was in essence like a tundra spruce parkland, right? Th this is uh, a place where there's not a lot of trees. The trees that are there are stunted, um, a lot of shrubby vegetation. And vegetation like this still remains, at least similar to that, in pockets in Western Maryland. So this is uh, a photo of, I think this is Cranesville, swamp right on the Maryland, West Virginia border. There are other examples like Wolf Swamp and Finzel Swamp and places like that um, that have, you know, what we might call ice, ice age relics. The, these are species that typically occur much further north where it's much colder. And for the time being, they're still holding on in these places. 
Um, of course, you know that Ice Age mammals were roaming the landscape as well. You're going to have one in, in your museum, which is super cool. Um, and I'm sure you probably know about the Cumberland Bone Cave, um, which uh, is just outside of Cumberland, Maryland, which uh, is along the bike trail now. So if you're ever riding your bike through Cumberland, you can stop and at least look at what's left of the Cumberland Bone Cave. But when they were putting the railroad in and dynamiting uh, through some, some bedrock in that area, they uncovered this cave that was just full of Ice Age mammoth bones. Um, I think there was about 40 genera of mammals. So most of those were probably small things like rodents and bats and, and that sort of thing. But also things like mammoths and short-faced bears and uh, saber-toothed cats. And there was even, I think, a tooth from a crocodile, which is, to me, that's that's a tough one. I don't know if someone was playing a prank on them and threw that in there, but um, it's hard to, it's a hard one to explain. But uh, it's, it's a, one of the best representations of the sort of collection of mammals that were living in this part of the world at that time. And I think many of these, um, I don't know, I don't know if you guys have any of these of these specimens or not, but a lot of them ended up in the Smithsonian because um, they were such high quality. Um, so, so what caused these climate cycles, right? We, we know that climate has changed through time. There's very good evidence for that. So, so what change, what, what's causing these changes in the past? Um, but so if we think really broadly, we take a step back and we're thinking about the planet as a whole and over long periods of time. We're not talking about seasonal variation or annual variation in temperatures. We're just talking about, you know, the, the, over the history of the earth. And it's really two things that are important. The first is the amount of solar energy coming into the planet. And the second is the amount of that energy that's lost back into space and how much heat trapping gases are in the atmosphere to uh, constrain the amount of heat that's being lost. So it's, it's really the interplay of these two things over really long periods of time that determines the Earth's global temperature. Um, and, you know, in terms of, well, what, what determines the energy coming in from the sun, where there's lots of things, um, but some of the more important are how close we are to the sun, that uh, we, we don't have a perfectly circular orbit and that orbit changes through time. And so right now, um, in, in the way the Earth's orbit is, we're actually closest uh, to the sun in winter in the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere is closest to the sun in their summer, which is now. Um, but at other times, uh, the Northern hemisphere is furthest from the sun during winter. And since we have so much land, that can really impact uh, the amount of cooling and the amount of, of ice that remains on the surface of the earth. Um, and then the other major factor is the tilt of the earth's surface that changes through time. And that also impacts the amount of solar radiation coming in uh, into the planet at different times of the year. Um, these are called Milankovitch cycles. So you may have heard of these. They're very well uh, demonstrated and they can be calculated in terms of the, the amount of solar energy coming into the planet because we understand orbital dynamics and all these things really well right now. But the fact that these, these different processes like the tilt of the earth and the distance from the sun, um, they have different periods of time. So sometimes they act together, right? So they're, they're kind of, um, uh, really adding to the effect and as other times they're opposing one another. It's, but so when, it's, when they're acting together, these different cycles is when we can see these rapid changes in, in climate. Um, right, so you know, there's the, these two things acting together. Um, and the second thing would be the amount of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. So I think I mentioned when I was talking about the ice cores is, or maybe I didn't, but one of the things that gets trapped in the ice is um, is air from the atmosphere. So as the snow falls, it traps a little bit of air in it that eventually gets incorporated into the ice and it remains in the ice as these very tiny bubbles. And so, you know, inside the ice, just like an ice cube in your drink, you can see these little bubbles um, and we can actually extract the air out of those bubbles and measure the concentration of different gases in the atmosphere from them. And so we can also show a 4,000, or I'm sorry, 400,000 year record of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And uh, I'm showing you here, this yellow line is the CO2 level before we started burning fossil fuels. So this is gonna be our reference number. And we're going to hopefully have um, an animation here that shows 
changes in CO2 in the atmosphere through time, right? And so we see it kind of following these similar cycles as um, the temperature profile, right? Um, and so the question would be, well, what's what's causing these changes in CO2? Um, well, that, that's it's it's a complicated answer, but the the short answer is is that you know, the changes in solar radiation coming in um, influence the biosphere and uh, how the biosphere is responding to temperature, and those processes have a strong influence on the amount of CO two. So it's kind of an interplay of these two things. But again, so we're seeing these cycles and. The thing to note here is that for the last 400,000 years and even going back much further than that, it's rare that CO2 and the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was higher than it was when we started burning fossil fuels. So we can overlap these two on one another, right? We get this very nice uh, plot. So I'm showing you temperature and CO2 together and they overlap almost perfectly, right? This very nice relationship between CO2 in the atmosphere and uh, temperature. Um, but it, you know, at this scale, it's hard to see um, some of the finer points here, like the lags that occur between um, which start, the increases in temperature sometimes start sooner than the increases in CO2 because the biosphere takes some time to respond. Um, it, you know, there's also interactions with, with the oceans and things like that. But over broad, broad time periods, this is the relationship that we see. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the greenhouse effect, so I'm going to go through this quickly. But um, you know, the, the solar radiation coming in from the sun, it's passing through our atmosphere, it's warming the surface of the Earth, and that warmth eventually uh, is radiated back into space. Um, and some of that radiation is trapped, right? It's trapped by the atmosphere, which is good because if that wasn't the case, we would see these huge swings in temperature from day to night and things like that it wouldn't make life very pleasant or possible or maybe impossible. Um, and so that's the greenhouse effect. Of course, we see this in our cars in the summer, right? You can bake cookies in your in your car in the summer. At least you can try. I'm not sure I would, I would eat those. Um, but the main point is the atmosphere actually acts like a blanket and the thickness of that blanket or the insulating effect of that blanket is tightly correlated related to um, the composition of the different gases in the atmosphere. Um, and this basic science was known well over a hundred years ago. I think oftentimes people think um, the idea of the greenhouse effect and the role CO2 would have in, in the regulating the planet's temperature was a relatively new discovery, but um, it was actually in the mid 1800s. So this was um, uh, this photo here is not actually of um, Eunice Newton Foote. It's I think of her niece because there aren't any photos that we know of of her. Um, but Eunice in the in the 1950s did a series of experiments where she took glass tubes and she filled them with different types of air. So she, she put like moist air in there. She used a, a tube with a vacuum in it, so no air, uh, a tube filled with uh, carbon dioxide and observed how much the, the temperature increased when these were placed in the sun. And there's this quote attributed to her that you can read here, um, but basically she's considered one of the first, one of the first people to come up with the idea of, of the greenhouse effect and saying that increases in CO2 would increase uh, the Earth's temperature. Let's see, where am I? There we go, okay. Um, John Tyndall came along a few years later. He did some additional experiments in a laboratory, um, kind of expanding on Eunice's work. Uh, he claimed that he knew of no experiments of the type he was doing um, but there is some evidence that he knew of Eunice's work, but just didn't cite it. Um, so uh, not, not very cool, John, if that's true, but um, he continued the science. And then in the late 1800s, Fonte Arrhenius um, was really the first, one of the first people to make the link between burning of fossil fuels and what effect it could have on the planet over the long term. 
And some of his work was done here relatively locally at the, he used observations from the Allegheny Observatory in Pittsburgh in his, his science and his calculations uh, to come up with the uh, expected uh, increase in temperature due to increases in CO2 in the atmosphere. So, you know, this is, this is well over a hundred years ago. Um, this is an article from the Selma Morning Times uh, uh, talking about his work where he says he has a new theory of the extinction of the human race. So it's a lovely thought. Um, and he's basically saying that, um, th this article is saying that if you keep burning fossil fuels, you're gonna, you're gonna bake the earth. Um, sorry, I have to stop sharing again so I can hide this thing that keeps popping up in front of me. Um, and I love how it says hint to coal consumers. Um, but you know, he's saying in the course of a few cycles of 10,000 years, <laughs> so, they had the timing a little wrong. Um, this is another article from a newspaper article in New Zealand. This one's from 1912, um, talking about how much uh, coal is being burned and how much CO2 is resulting as that. And it says, this tends to make the air a more effective blanket for the earth and to raise its temperature. The effect may be considerable in a few centuries. So again, they, uh, they were right about the science, but wrong about the time, or, or at least because we probably ended up burning fossil fuels a lot more quickly than than was expected. Um, right, so you know we're we're throwing things out of balance in a lot of ways by increasing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, so what caused these climate cycles? Um, you know, it's it's this interaction between between natural processes and and CO two in the biosphere and we know from the data that carbon dioxide was rarely above 300 parts per million in the atmosphere during the last 800,000 years and near 280 parts per million at the start of the industrial revolution. From these data, we see that a 60% increase in CO2 resulted in about 14 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. So that's a massive amount of change in global temperature, right? That, that's going from a near, um, you know, near tropical to near ice age conditions in the same place over a period of time. And these cycles suggest we're actually due for an ice age, right? If, if we look at the data here in, in this top panel where we see these cycles of warming and cooling um, that end in this period that we're at now where there's this relatively stable, at least, uh, pre-industrial stable climate, um, we really should have been going into an ice age, not into a warming period. Okay, so that was the past. So let's move on to the present. How am I doing for time? Good, okay. Um, so the recent increases in CO2 over the last several decades, the industrial revolution exceed those over the last few million years. So this is where we were in 2019 we exceeded 400 parts per million. I'm not sure where we are today. I think we're 420, 430, maybe something like that. I should have, should have checked before this talk. Um, but you can see that just in a few, a few decades, we've far exceeded not only the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, but the rate of change uh, in CO2 in the atmosphere. So we're really entering new territory here that the earth has not experienced any time um, in, in recent geologic history even. Um, right, so we've seen a 50% increase in 60 years. So remember on my previous slide, I said a 60% increase resulted in 14 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Um, so we're, we're nearing that level of increase in CO2, but it's the lag in the climate response to that that we haven't fully experienced yet or we're experienced the lie, we haven't ex experienced the full brunt of that change. Um, so continuous measurements of CO2 began in the late 1950s. So this is a very uh, important data set. This uh, was collected by Charles Keeling at uh, Scripps Institute in, I guess, San Diego. He went to Hawaii and began measuring the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that uh, data set uh, has continued through time. And I don't know if you've ever seen these data before, but they not only document the increase in CO2 as we burn fossil fuels, but the annual change in concentration in the atmosphere due to um, 
this is what you're basically seeing is the greening up of the northern hemisphere forests in the spring. So they start taking in um, CO2 as they leaf out. And then in the fall, when those leaves are returned to the earth and decomposed, that CO2 is released again. There's also a signal of the southern hemisphere, but there's just not as much forest in the southern hemisphere. So it's really the, the temperate northern uh, uh, hemisphere forests that are a big part of this signal. So we have, we have many different ways that we can measure temperature. I mean, obviously we think of thermometers, but there weren't um, uh, thermometers back in time, uh, you know, over the last thousand years. So we can use the other, what we would call proxies for, for temperature. I'm sure Haley probably talked about, about proxies a lot in her talk, since that's something she studies. Um, and all of these different ways that we can measure temperature all tell the same story is that rapid warming began about 150 years ago and accelerated, especially in the mid 20th century. Um, we can also see the medieval warm period on here, which was a, a brief period where places like Greenland were colonized and also the Little Ice Age, um, where Northern Europe in particular um, was much colder than it is today. Sorry, folks, but I have to once again, um, I have to hide this thing that keeps popping up in the, I wonder if I put this down here. If it pops up, it won't be in my way anymore. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hide floating controls. Okay, let's play this again. Okay, so um, NASA has reconstructed uh, maps of global temperature using various data sets. And perhaps you've seen this, uh, this uh, movie as well. But what I'm about to show you is um, how climate has changed since the late, la oh, sorry, late 1800s. Um, so blues mean the, the region was colder than the average. Um, so again, we're looking at anomalies. And reds and yellows mean the area was warmer than the average. And we're starting in the mid 1800s. And we're going to go to near present day with this. So I'm going to let that this go ahead and play. And what you can see, right, there's times that places are warm and there's times that places are cold. And that's just, you know, the nature of climate. Um, but what you're going to start to see is that the places that are cold get fewer and fewer and the places that get really warm, anom anonymously warm, are going to rapidly increase, especially once we get to the 90s and the 2000s until most of the planet has a fever. So this start stops in 2018. Um, since that time, we've had some of the warmer years and recorded um, in, in the climate record. Um, so this map would be even darker and even more red if we had the most recent data, which I should check to see if NASA has updated this map or not. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the physical systems of the earth and the biosphere are are responding rapidly to these changes. So, um, you know, we've, we've all seen the photos of glaciers retreating, they're retreating extremely rapidly. Um, so we're losing ice as the planet warms. Um, but what about Maryland? So this is a photo from a place not that far from, from my house. This is Monroe Run Overlook. If you've never been there, it's a really beautiful place. Um, so how, how has climate changed in Maryland over the past several decades or 100 years or so. So again, we're looking at temperature anomalies here, starting in 1895, going up to 2019. And we can see a clear warming trend through time, especially starting in the mid 1980s. And so on average, um, Maryland is about two degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, versus the reference period. Precipitation doesn't really show a trend. There's not a clear increase in the amount of precipitation. But what we're seeing instead is that the wettest years are getting wetter. And this is very consistent with what we'd expect um, from our understanding of how climate systems respond to warming. Warm air can hold more moisture. That moisture has to come out somehow. And so what we're seeing is more precipitation and often in fewer events. So each precipitation event uh, drops more rain on, on Maryland than, than they did historically. And as you know, we've had 
flooding in places like Ellicott City and that sort of thing, these torrential downpours. Um, of course, and if you're in coastal Maryland, there is uh, sea level rise. So sea level is rising. Um, the Chesapeake Bay is one of the has have one of the higher rates of sea level rise in the world for a couple of reasons. It's um, one of which is that uh, the area is still it's actually sinking in response to the melting of the glaciers to the north. Um, so as those glaciers melted, New England is kind of rebounding and the mid-Atlantic is sinking. It's exacerbating the increase in, uh, in sea level rise. Um, so the question is, you often hear is like, well, climate changes all the time. You, Matt, you told us that uh, the amount of solar radiation changes coming into the planet, the amount of, of CO2 in the atmosphere changes. Couldn't there be other natural effects like volcanoes or just what have you? Um, well, we can look at that. So here I'm showing you a plot of um, the average global temperature versus the 20th century average. So we've seen things like this before and we see this clear warming trend. And we can sort of take out all of the little individual pieces that are contributing to this pattern through time. So changes in Earth's orbit over this period of time have very little effect. Um, the effect is um, certainly not either cooling or warming and, and those effects are small overall. Changes in solar output really don't contribute much to this pattern at all. Volcanic activity has a strong cooling effect. So when volcanoes erupt, they put a lot of, of course, dust into the atmosphere and also um, sulfur-based uh, gases, all of which contribute to cooling in the near term. So especially, I guess the one in the, night, in the late 1800s um, would have been, I think it's is that Krakatoa probably in Indonesia. And then in the uh, 90s, this last spiking would have been uh, Pinatubo in the Philippines. And I'm not, and maybe, I'm not sure if that's Mount St. Helens in the early 80s or not, not 100% sure. But volcanic activity basically leads to short term cooling. So if we combine all of these natural factors together, um, we don't really see any any warming trend, right? We don't, we don't see the Earth's, the Earth's temperature increasing. Um, but if we look at the effect of just, if we isolate the effect of just greenhouse gases, we see a clear upward trend through time. And if we combine these natural factors with the greenhouse gases, we see the natural factors actually have led, have prevented um, some warming. And you can see the effects of, of the volcanic, volcanic eruptions and, and cooling over time. Okay, so can these be natural? No, there's no way that we can explain the response of the climate system or the way the climate system is acting without invoking the burning of fossil fuels. There's just no science uh, that can explain that without those factors included. Okay, so where are we headed? Um, the future. So this is where we are today, right? We're just over 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. And the question we wanna ask is, well, where do our current behaviors take us? What if we just keep doing what we're doing? Well, if we didn't change anything and we kept continuing to burn fossil fuels, which fortunately we have changed a lot over the past few years, but um, we would be in a place that's unprecedented over millions of years. All the variability you see at the bottom is all compressed relative to these rapid increases in CO2 concentration that would occur um, you know, over the next 70 years or so. You know, so this would take us back eventually to Antarctica being a tropical forest uh, and not covered in ice. Now it would take a long time for that ice to melt, but this is where the climate system would be heading uh, given our current behaviors. So we call that, this is often called the business as usual scenario, um, but there's lots of different scenarios. We don't have to continue doing what we're doing. Um, we could uh, intervene in some ways, right? Uh, things like uh, renewable energy and other things that we can do to reduce fossil fuel consumption. 
this is where the Paris Climate Accord would take us. Um, it would take us to just over 500 uh, parts per million in the atmosphere. And then the most sort of, um, I guess, unrealistic, uh, to be honest, um, but most dramatic change would be rapid substantial intervention, which um, we've, that, that this, this scenario will remain a scenario because I don't see us ever, ever being able to change our behaviors that quickly, even with the best of intentions and the political will to do so. Um, so we can look at different projections, temperature projections for the year 2100 uh, based on these different scenarios. And these are color coded just like they were in the previous slide. So we see business as usual, taking us to about seven degrees Fahrenheit warming by the end of the century and the Paris Climate Accord. Um, and I'm sorry, let me put that line in, falls right there. So that's the two degrees C limit that you sometimes hear about in the news that scientists don't want us to go beyond two degrees C. If we can stop it, that turns out to be 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. And that aligns pretty well with the the Paris Climate Accord goals. Um, doable, but we're running out of time and it's becoming increasingly difficult uh, to have any hope of, of meeting those goals and staying under this limit. Okay, so let's see how this works. I'm gonna have to probably stop sharing. Um, so what will Maryland's climate feel like in the future if we continue the way we're going, so I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and I'm going to share this screen. And then refresh this. There we go. Okay, so um, in, I guess this was early 2019, I published a study trying to answer this question of you know, what's the planet gonna feel like if climate changes the way, way we expect it to? You, we hear a lot in the news about things like two degrees C of warming and you know, three degrees Fahrenheit average change and this, that, and the other. And nobody knows what the heck that actually is gonna feel like, right? We, we don't experience mean global temperature, right? We experience seasonal variation in weather in the place that we live. And so it's, it's really hard for people to get their head around the magnitude of these changes. You know, three degrees Fahrenheit doesn't sound like very much. I mean, at my house today, the temperature went from, you know, the, the upper 20s to the mid 40s, right? That's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Why should I care about three degrees Fahrenheit? Um, so I, I, I did a study that tried to translate these future forecasts into something that hopefully is more understandable, more relatable, uh, to, um, to people than, than just these, these abstract numbers. And so we, we don't have a time machine, right? We can't, we can't get in our time machine and go to the year 2100 and, and uh, go to Baltimore and say, well, what, what's the climate gonna feel like? But we can ask the question, say, if, if we have a sense of what we think Baltimore's climate is gonna be like in the future, we can ask what current place has that climate? And we can go to that place uh, hopefully walking or riding a bike, not burning fossil fuels, and experience that climate and uh, see what we get. So you can try this, this app out. Um, so if we click on Baltimore, we see that for high emissions, Baltimore's climate in 2080 is going to feel like basically Northern Mississippi. So Northern Mississippi is about six degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, in summer and about 8% drier. So not a big change. In precipitation. We do expect the mid-Atlantic to get wetter, but the major thing here is going to be warming. And we see a similar pattern for a lot of the mid-Atlantic cities. Um, we see northern Mississippi for Washington, D.C., which makes sense, right? Washington's climate's not that different from Baltimore's. Uh, same for New York, right? We're, we're Arkansas. Um, uh, so th this study kind of, um, it really resonated with people. It, it got a much stronger reaction than, than I ever expected. Um, and we have recently, haven't released these yet, but we've recently re-performed these analyses using the latest uh, future climate forecasts. And um, thanks to the increases in computing power, we were able to run these analyses for about 5,000 cities globally. So now we've moved beyond North America and have uh, have some some estimates of this globally. 
those aren't ready uh, for prime time yet. Um, and the results aren't really that different. It's just more places, but you can play with this app and, and uh, uh, learn something about, about what climate might be like in, in 60 years and that our children and our grandchildren um, might experience. Let's see. Okay, let me stop sharing that and go back to my, my talk. Where did it go? There we go. Okay. And play. Okay. Okay, so the so what question. Um, some people are quite cynical and they're like, okay, well, so what? Like I live in Boston. I, I'm perfectly happy for the winter to be six degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Um, bring Florida to me. I don't have to go there. Um, so why should we care? Um, well, the headlines probably that I started with should tell you why why you should care because you know uh, if you're you know Maryland is relatively buffered from from the worst effects of climate change. Yes, sea level rise is a thing, and hurricanes could affect us, and there could be flooding. Um, but I live in Western Maryland, so I don't really need to worry about sea level rise. I probably don't really need to worry about hurricanes. Um, and I don't, I don't live in a, in a river valley, so I probably don't need to worry about flooding. So why should I care? Um, well, you, you can't escape climate change, right? The, the global economy is, is connected. When there's flooding in California or there's fires in California or there's drought in California, um, that's going to impact our food prices. When there's drought in the Middle East, uh, there's good evidence that that led to some of the conflicts in Syria. Right. So all of these things happening globally are eventually going to affect us, even if it's not a direct effect. Um, so, you know, I've mentioned hurricanes, I've mentioned droughts, I've mentioned sea level rise. Um, but, you know, there are places in the world where in Europe in particular, where people don't have air conditioning. And when there were heat waves in Europe, in Paris, for example, a lot of people died in response to that. And this is only going to get worse and it's going to affect um, the most uh, vulnerable populations the most. Um, and then there's disease, right? There's tropical diseases that are starting to show up in Florida and other places that were never prev prevalent. Lyme disease is increasing. Um, I still get ticks on, on me when I walk outside here in Western Maryland in December. Um, and it's because the tick populations are exploding because it's not getting cold enough to control those populations. So what can we do? How am I doing on time? Good. Okay, almost exactly forty-five minutes. Um, I love I love to show this cartoon. If you haven't seen this already, um, this person is presenting and saying, "Well, you know, if we if we try to address climate change, we could have energy independence, uh, green jobs, livable cities, et cetera, et cetera." And then somebody stands up and says, "What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing?" Um, so the idea being like a lot of the solutions to climate change should lead to increases in the quality of life overall. You know, I'm not a blind idealist. I realize that these things come at a cost, but doing nothing also comes at a cost and most likely will come at a greater cost overall. So we got it. We're going to, we're going to feel the pain somewhere or another. We might as well feel the pain implementing positive solutions in my opinion. Um, so what are the solutions? This is an interesting uh, table I found that um, kind of ranked the different things um, and you know things like refrigerant management so these are these are additional gases that can uh, have very strong warming effects if they're released into the atmosphere um, wind turbines of course so it's renewable energy things like reducing food waste eating a plant-rich diet um, all have pretty large impacts and are at the top of these lists um, and then there's things that are interesting, like educating girls and family planning that you don't hear a lot about. Um, and so what's educating girls? Well, um, we're really talking about developing nations where um, the more educated women are, the fewer children they have, and the fewer people there are, the, you know, having, having fewer people on the planet is another way to address um, a lot of the stresses related to climate change. And you can see solar is on there as well. Um, so renewable energy, um, when I gave this talk in 2019, we didn't have uh, the level of federal tax credits that are now available. Um, so that's a good thing, especially for rooftop solar. Um, you may not know this, but if you are a resident of Maryland, you can choose which company provides your electricity. And if you'd like, you can go online 
and say, I want uh, my electricity, I want to purchase my electricity from a supplier that is 100% renewable. Now that doesn't mean, you know, someone comes to your house and they're going to take a big plug and plug you into a solar array somewhere, but it forces those companies to buy on the open market. And so if a lot more people were doing this, that would force these electric companies to rely less and less on fossil fuels and increasingly on renewable resources. So that's an option. Um, I like to show this as well. Um, you know, this, this letter to your grandchildren, um, there's, you know, it does feel like there's less people arguing about whether global climate change is a problem or not. Um, but, um, you know, one day we're going to have to potentially uh, tell our children what we thought and what we did about it. Um, and this is one way to do that. And I think that's it. So I'm happy to take questions. I'm sorry, I haven't been keeping up with the chat. I did see some, I think some stuff coming in, but um, yeah, happy to have questions. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this has been wonderful. Unshare, we'll come back together. Uh, I know that people do want to get the app. Um, and if, if you could put, uh, put that in the chat box, that would be great. If yeah, a sure. Question about, um, I'm going to put a spotlight on you. So that we can all look. I don't know that I've ever had a spotlight on me. I'm not sure what that is, but. <laughs> see, where's the Zoom spotlight? You are spotlighted. <laughs> um, so, as always, you can put the chat your uh, questions in the chat. You can raise your hand, and I'll call on you um, if you'd like to ask a question directly um, to Matt. Um, we have Adrian who wrote earlier uh, about anomalies. How are they calculated for more recent times, like comparing today's climate to the past hundred years as the climate warms? Isn't it changing that reference period itself? How is that taken into consideration with calculating and graphing anomalies? That's a good question. Um, you know, the client, the climate scientists um, are, the, are the experts on on the, how those things are defined. You know, when we when we call something climate versus weather, climate is a a thirty year average um, of, of of weather. Um, and so the, these reference periods, you, you know, th this, is a, this is a good question because the reference periods change depending on the data set you're looking at for sure. So um, in some cases, the reference period is, is an average of, um, you know, the, the pre and post industrial period up to a certain time. And they, they calculate the anomalies all relative to that. But it can, it can really change depending um, on the data set and, and what is being shown. But by having these standard reference periods um, prevents, um, you know, it's, it's the fairest way to show the data, right? There, there's a standard reference period and everything's shown against that. Um, it's, it's true that as the climate warms, it could change the reference period, but, um, the, you know, the reference period is fixed. So when, when, when an anomaly plot is shown, that is fixed. And um, in, in, in terms of like a lot of what you would see in the IPCC reports, those reference periods are fixed and they're used throughout the same, um, same report time and time again. So it's, it's not typically changing. I hope that answered your question, but it's, there's not one answer to that. All right, we have Greg. Do we have a long-term record of methane in the atmosphere? That's a good question. I'm not sure off the top of my head if we do um, or not. Um, I know that I have definitely seen methane uh, plots. I just don't remember how far back in time that X axis went, but I, I do believe um, we do. I just don't think methane is as stable and remains in the atmosphere as long as CO2. So I'm not sure we can go as far back in time. Heidi asks, when in the past has CO2 been as high as predicted for 2100? Yeah, so for the business as usual scenario where we reach close to a thousand parts per million at 2100, um, I'm not gonna be able to get you the, the exact time period, but it's, it's millions of years ago. It's certainly well before humans evolved and walked the earth. So, you know, th this would be unprecedented 
uh, for humans for sure and and a lot deeper in time than that and when you show the picture of antarctica in a nice jungle scene what was the configuration of the continents in the same position or were they different yeah, I mean, there there is that effect too, for sure. Um, but that I'm trying to remember what that 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 artist rendition uh, when that the time period it was trying to um, that it was representing. And you're right that that there is some movement of the continents, um, but that time period shown in that figure was not figure, but that that artist rendition. Um, was not that was not the dominant effect for sure. Yeah, it played a role, no question, but it wasn't the dominant effect. And um, you mentioned that it's the the, the continuation of the, the melting of the glaciers that are causing sea level rise, and I just wanted to uh, make people aware that in the last glacial maximum, there really wasn't a Chesapeake Bay, and it was the melting of the glaciers and filling up of streams and rivers like the Susquehanna Valley and all the other rivers that flooded um, to create the Chesapeake Bay. So we're seeing, again, it's that we're seeing time and it is not stagnant. We're, we're all in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a flux moving um, as we did, even though the glaciers didn't make it as far south as Maryland, we still felt the uh, effects of that through landscape changes as well yeah and in fact like there was there was a slide that i i didn't show i don't i don't know if i have it as an extra slide but um there's been some work done on um the eastern shore using some methods to measure the elevation of the ground with very high accuracy um, and when that was done there was some clear patterns of small sand dunes that could be seen You'd never see them on the ground because there's forests and all these sorts of things. But there's these clear linear sand dunes that show up in certain places um, on the Eastern shore. And that is from the, the high winds and dust and things that were, were the, the winds that were coming off the ice sheets and the ground rock that was creating dust that made these sort of features that are largely invisible in the landscape today, but can, can be seen through these other methods. It's pretty fascinating. That's very cool, and, and lots of fishermen pull up mastodons and mammoths from uh, when they're out there trawling uh, because they were walking, or even gompatheers from earlier times that maybe floated down a river into that area. Um, uh, Rich asks, "What with permafrost now starting to accelerate its thawing, is the addition of any greenhouse gases?" Um, mainly methane being released and might be released in the near term being considered in any of the models. Yeah, and this is like, you know, this gets in the feedback mechanisms where where warming causes increasing warming. So as as all, all, there's a lot of carbon that's locked up in in uh, permafrost, right? It's, it's a lot of its vegetation, it's frozen, it's kind of locked in state. And once that gets starts to fall, it decomposes, and you're right. It releases uh, methane and and other carbon-based gases. Um, and yes, I the extent to which those feedback mechanisms are included in the in these big large models, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm sure that those scenarios have been run with certainty. Um, there's other effects like um, the melting of the polar ice cap. Uh, it changes the albedo, the reflectance of the Earth's surface, right? It's no longer a white surface, it's now seawater. And so that absorbs a lot more um, heat. And so, you, you you know, it's just these increasing, and, and the Arctic is one of the places that's expected to warm the most. And to me, this is the scariest thing is that we could get in a situation where our attempts to fix things have, no longer have any effect because of these runaway effects and other natural systems that are going to dominate um, the contribution of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. There's more questions about methane. Methane seems to be on people's minds. 
Um, Richard asks, I understand that there's lots of frozen methane in deep oceans, and won't rising ocean temps cause this to escape eventually? Yeah, I mean, this is another area. I don't know a lot about this, but I am familiar with the idea um, that there are, um, how could I describe them? I forget the term, but it's in essence kind of like frozen methane that's in the very cold waters deep in the ocean and that um, warming, that they would be very sensitive to warming because they're they're at a very sort of like, um, their transition from one state to another can happen very rapidly with a little bit of warming. Um, I'm drawing a blank on what those are called. Um, it'll come to me, but yes, that that's definitely a concern and it's not something I think is well understood um and and so there's there's lots of um you know you, you often i think you often hear people saying well it's people are alarmists it's it may not be as bad as as the scientists are saying well that's true it may not be as bad but the other side of the coin is it could be worse i mean they could be wrong in both directions right um there's no reason you're and it, it seems to be um the recent evidence suggests that underestimation has been the norm not overestimation there's another question from Richard um, to Bronwyn, if you want me yeah, to read that and, one. And that's, yeah, the different, um, different ways that carbon dioxide can get into the atmosphere um, besides human causing uh, the forest fires, volcanoes, um, escape from Earth's crust. Yep, you're right. Um, there are natural sources of, of CO2, um, but uh, we we know that the the increases that we're measuring um, cannot be explained by um, by those natural sources alone. So if we think back to the Keeling curve, um, there's no reason that we would expect um, you know a continual increase in CO2 from just natural sources, right? Some years have fire, some don't. Um, the, the biosphere is very good at, at cycling the carbon. Um, you know, the, the, the ocean can absorb certain amounts of that as well. It's the fact that we see this like this continued increase that um, really puts the finger on burning of fossil fuels. Matt, if we were if we if, if we weren't around and did what we did um, in terms of just the natural uh, cycle. Would we? You said that we would be going back into an ice age. Um, have, have anybody modeled that at about what time, um, as the glaciers would, you know, start? We would start reglaciating and and and, and going backwards. Yeah, I. Um, you know, if we look at the Milankovitch cycles and and the amount of solar radiation coming in, we should be going. You know, we should be bending the curve towards cooling again. The exact timing of that, I'm not sure. Um, the thing that I didn't say a lot about, I just mentioned briefly, is that if you zoom in on um, that that 400,000 year temperature record, like the last 10,000 years, there's this kind of remarkable, very stable period that is is when you consider the record of the whole, sort of stands out as as one of the more stable time periods. Um, Exactly why climate remained stable for that long during that time period, I, I don't know the answer, and I don't know if the answer is known, but it's interesting that it coincides basically with the development of, of civilization, right, that that it's a lot harder to develop civilization when you have, um, you know, extreme cold and, and climate that's that's um, swinging from one extreme to another over, over decades or centuries or what have you. Um, so, I, I, and I guess one other thing I'll say is that when I was, um, I, I took some geology classes and this was in the late nineties now. Um, and I asked my geology professor who studied ice age um, types questions, what he thought about climate change. And he's like, well, he's like, we'll definitely see warming over the next centuries from humans inputting, you know, uh, uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere but he's like but over the longer term we're going to go back into a cooling because you just can't um you know you, the the effects of of these other forces like the amount of solar radiation will become dominant i don't know if you would still say that now or not but um 
that's what he said then. So methane hydrates, yes, that's it. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, the I found it was very interesting when you talked about just the number of people on the earth. And I guess have we have we looked into I mean China's population is going down, Europe's population and Russia it's all all decreasing. Are we we're decreasing and slowing on a on a global basis overall? So that's that's kind of a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the demographic projections, which we're really good at doing, um, we do see a pretty rapid decline um, towards the end of this century. It really freaks out economists. Like they see this as a real problem because all of our economics are based on the idea that economies grow and they continue to grow. And when they see something like that, that is gonna impact growth, it becomes worrisome, but um, I think it's obvious that economies can't grow forever. <laughs> so um, we should probably start to learn to live with a steady state economy rather than a, than a growing economy. But. All right. Anybody else have any questions for Matt? And I do appreciate um, the, the, the understanding of Maryland's um, ecology during the ice age because and, and looking at everything below the ice sheet um, just because I'm just fixated on mammoths at this time but a mammoth ate had to eat over 400 pounds of vegetation a day so they mammoths were not up there on the ice sheets in the cold so they were they were it was a it was a lush environment albeit very you know cooler yep yeah all right i'm just i'm just living in the ice age y'all i'm sorry but that's it's, exci it's exciting it's exciting and i want y'all to come visit us um and, and meet our, our mammoth uh, but thank you so much matt for this wonderful presentation i echo everybody's uh comments take a look at the app it's really fascinating and we're, we're anxious to see um the 2.0 version that's that's coming out um, as well. And everybody stay well, stay curious, stay outside, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.